Hello, this is Michael Altos. We are continuing our discussion of fundamentals of clinical pharmacology. This is recording part three. Now we're going to talk about kinetics. When we talk about first order kinetics, we're talking about the idea that a fixed percentage or a fraction of existing drug is removed from the bloodstream per unit time. So the amount that's actually removed depends on the current serum level, and it changes depending on the serum level. But the fraction removed, the percentage removed, does not depend on serum levels. It's constant. Let's look at this graph over here. And in blue, we see first-order kinetics. We see the drug has dropped from 1, a concentration of 1, to a concentration of 0.5 over about 7 minutes. So in the next seven minutes, we expect it to drop from 0.5 to about 0.25. Again, it's lost half of its concentration. And then from 0.25 to 0.12 is another seven minutes. So every unit time, we lose the same percentage of drug. If 10% is removed per minute, we call that a K of 0.1 per minute, which just means that 10% is removed per minute. That's a very helpful way to understand these rate constants. Zero order kinetics means that a fixed amount of drug is removed per unit time. It has nothing to do with serum concentration. Here in red, we see zero order kinetics. In five minutes, we lost 0.1. In the next five minutes, another 0.1. In the next five minutes, another 0.1. It doesn't matter what the concentration is. We lose the same amount per unit time. Certain drugs usually undergo zero order kinetics, like alcohol. You may hear people talk about being able to metabolize a drink an hour or something like that. That's an example of zero order kinetics. But many drugs which undergo first order kinetics will convert to zero order kinetics at very high serum concentrations. And this happens especially if the concentration is higher than your body's cap capacity to metabolize the drug. Let's look at the simulation. In this simulation, we see drug molecules approaching an enzyme and being converted into a metabolite. And as I increase my drug dose, more and more drug is being delivered and metabolized. But at some point, I've actually given more drug than the enzymes can manage. And so some drug is passing through the liver, but not being metabolized. Here we see the same setup again. But now we're going to look at the concentration in the plasma as the dose increases. So here we are at a low dose, and we get a certain concentration. And at a higher dose, we have a higher serum concentration. And this continues until we start giving more drug than metabolism can handle. The metabolism is saturated, and now look what happens. I give a dose, and suddenly my serum levels have shot way up because metabolism can't keep up with my dose. You can imagine that if I'm trying to titrate a dangerous drug, here I can give a little bit more and get a little bit more concentration. Give a little bit more drug, get a little bit more concentration. But suddenly when I overwhelm my uh, system's metabolic abilities, the concentrations are shooting up. And this, if this is a dangerous drug, this is a dangerous place to be changing doses. Bringing it all together now, most drugs have the relationship that we just described where as dose goes up, concentration goes up in a nice linear fashion, and they're having first-order elimination. But at high doses, and for some drugs like uh, alcohol, we see that they undergo zero-order kinetics. And so we're seeing that metabolism has been saturated, and instead of undergoing first-order kinetics, we've now switched into zero-order kinetics. The next concept we want to go over is half-life. Half-life is the amount of time it takes for your serum concentration to change by a factor of two. That is, to drop, to be cut in half. Drugs that have a shorter half-life require more frequent redosing. Let's take a look at the simulation. Here we're looking at the concentration of drug in the plasma as a function of time. And we give an IV dose of a drug. And here we see some nice first-order kinetics. And the half-life says that for it to drop from one concentration to half of that concentration takes a certain amount of time. And that amount of time is called the half-life. 
and then for it to drop a second time takes another half-life. The half-life is the same at all concentrations when you have first-order elimination. Jumping ahead to module 3 here, we can talk about giving a drug and we get a dose and then the dose falls until we give another dose. Our goal is to keep the concentration higher than the minimum effective concentration but lower than the minimum toxic concentration. And if a drug has a really short half-life, you can see that we may need to increase our dose size in order to stay inside that safe range. The other thing we could do is change our dose interval. If I give doses less often, I have to give more dose in order to stay inside this safe range. But you can see I'm sort of falling below the effective concentration, then I'm in the toxic concentration. This is probably not so good. If I give doses more frequently, then I can give smaller doses in order to stay inside this safe range. And if I give really frequent doses, I could give even smaller doses. And this is what we would almost call getting close to an infusion, where we're giving constantly tiny little doses, again, to stay inside the safe range. And we'll stop right here with this simulation. You should probably know that half-life is calculated as the log of 2 divided by k, where k is the rate constant that describes the elimination. This is just significant because after five half-lives, if you do the math, you'll see that the process is about 97% complete. So usually five half-lives is taken as an amount of time sufficient to clear a drug out of a system. The next topic we want to discuss is volume of distribution. The volume of distribution helps us understand how a drug is distributed in a system. It describes the capacity of tissues for absorbing a certain drug. And it depends on the patient's tissue mass and how that drug, how much affinity that drug has for the tissue. We can say that the volume of distribution is a numeric index of the extent of drug distribution and it describes how drug behaves in the body. Let's take a look at the simulation to understand this. So let's just imagine some very simple math. We have a one liter volume, we inject 100 milligrams into it, and we get a concentration of 100 milligrams per liter. If I put it into 10 liters, I still have 100 milligrams but it's more diluted. And in 100 liters, it's the most diluted of all. That's pretty straightforward. The same thing happens in the body. When I inject 100 milligrams into a patient, so first it goes into their plasma, which is, let's say, about 5 liters. So that would make a concentration of about 20 milligrams per liter. They have a volume of distribution of 5 liters. If I would take a sample of this liquid here, and analyze it, I would say, well, I gave 100 milligrams, and now the concentration is 20 milligrams per liter. The math says the volume is 5 liters. But we know that a lot of drugs, and this is true for really polar substances, really hydrophilic substances that stay mostly in water compartments. But we know that a lot of our drugs redistribute. They may redistribute into the extracellular fluid. So you can see it's a little bit more dilute. It's still the same 100 milligrams, but now I sample the fluid. I can just sample here, let's say, and oh, it's only 6.7 milligrams per liter. So do the math. That's a 15 liter volume, the plasma and the extracellular fluid. And then some drugs redistribute also into the intracellular fluid. So now I measure the concentration, and it's only 2.2 milligrams per liter. The math says that comes out to 45 liters. Wow, 45 liters is about how much water is in a person. Well, then you have other drugs that distribute all the way into the muscle group. And your muscle group, now no one has 100 liters of muscle. But what happens is once the drug is distributed into this muscle group and I take a sample from the blood, now the blood's only 0.7 milligrams per liter. Well, if I do the math, 100 milligrams injected into a volume 
and a final concentration of 0.7 milligrams per liter, that's 145 liters. And if I add fat, that is, the drug distributes into the fat compartment, now I have a concentration of 0.09 milligrams per liter, that comes out to over 1,000 liters. Now, none of our patients are so big that they have a volume of 1,000 liters. But what we're seeing is that the drug has so much affinity for this fat compartment, it's as if it was a water compartment that had a volume of a thousand liters. It's really a fat compartment that maybe only has a couple liters, but the drug has so much affinity for the fat that it's drawn there the same way that it would be drawn to dissolve in a thousand liters of water. So you can see that volume of distribution is not a true volume, but it's a measure of how a drug distributes to different compartments in the body. And so a patient with a, ver a drug and a patient with a very large volume of distribution the result will be a very low concentration of drug back there in the central compartment. Here we can see it in the human body. Here's a drug that distributes only into the vasculature, which is about 5 liters. And here we can see it starting to distribute more into the extracellular space, blood and tissues, other tissues, and actually concentrating in the fat tissues, where virtually all the concentration is distributed through the body and there's very little left in the, intracellular, in the intravascular compartment. This last um, graph here just takes what we've seen so far, and it shows that as volume of distribution increases, we can't generate a very high concentration in the central compartment, in the plasma, because it's constantly distributing out of the plasma. In general, when we talk about a large volume of distribution, we're talking about lipophilic drugs that are very soluble in fat. Um, obviously, a patient who has a lot of fat tissue will also be providing more of a volume of distribution. Either way, the fat-soluble drugs will not have as high of an intravascular concentration because they're redistributing into the fat. Again, we can calculate volume of distribution by looking at amount of drug given divided by the serum concentration. And so, if you wanted to calculate a loading dose, you would just take the known, the known volume of distribution and multiply it by your target concentration. One other concept we should just touch on briefly is the idea of elimination clearance. We already mentioned clearance when we were talking about the liver. Clearance is just this theoretical volume of blood from which drug is completely removed in a unit of time. And we know that that's not really how it happens because it's not completely removed just most of it is removed, or some of it is removed, and it's a reiterative process. Nevertheless, it's helpful to think of the theoretical volume of blood from which drug is completely removed in a unit of time. This is called the elimination clearance, and we can calculate it by looking at declining blood levels after an IV injection. We can see that here in the simulation briefly. In this simulation, we're showing water flowing into a beaker, and the water is starting to build up. We can also put a hole in the bottom of the beaker, and water flows out. And at the right balance, we don't have water flowing, we don't have water levels rising or falling. What's going in is the same as what's coming out. So we can imagine this is like drug dose, and this is clearance of drug, elimination clearance by the kidneys. We can do the same thing with a patient. Here we are administering a drug into the patient, and drug levels are going up and up and up, but fortunately they have kidneys working and the liver, creating clearance. And when the two are balanced, our drug levels, our drug concentrations stay constant. The patient develops some kidney disease, and we don't adjust our dose, then the patient starts to get to toxic levels. On the other hand, if we underdose our drug, then we don't get to the effective dose, the effective concentration that we need. Here's the same thing on a different graph. Again, here's our dose. The dose creates a certain concentration. And look, we've overshot and we've gone into toxic range. But if we have our kidneys and our liver working, then we have a nice balance between dose and clearance. And our concentration levels off nicely in the safe zone. And this summarizes it all together. Here you can see a dose which causes 
concentrations to build up, and we want our concentration to be, we want our dose to be balanced with the clearance, so that levels hover right in the safe zone, not in the ineffective zone, not in the toxic zone. The elimination half-life is a kind of a half-life, but it's not the half-life of how long does it take for levels in the serum to drop by, uh, by a factor of two. It's how long does it take to get drug out of the body by a factor of two. So this accounts for the drug in the serum, in the brain, in the fat, and everywhere. All those milligrams of drug, how long does it take to decrease it by a factor of two? So you can imagine this depends on both distribution and elimination. We call this the T half beta, and it has components of half-life in it as well as uh, elimination. So an example of this, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but just to briefly introduce it to you. For example, we can talk about thiopental, uh, barbiturate, and it has a prolonged elimination half-life in the elderly. If you give this to these people, it takes a long time for them to get it out of their body. It's not that they can't metabolize it, it's because elderly people have increased body fat. And so the clearance is still good, the kidneys still work well, but they have a larger volume of distribution, and so it takes longer to get this drug out of the body. And every time their serum clears some of it, more drug comes out of the fat back into the central compartment, back into the circulation. Or pancuronium. If you have a patient with renal disease, pancuronium has a prolonged elimination half-life. Why? It's not because of a change in volume of distribution. Pancuronium is pretty hydrophilic. But in this case, it's clearance. Their ability to clear the drug is impaired because they have renal disease. So this is the idea of elimination half-life, which doesn't say anything about how long it takes for the drug to stop working. That really depends on serum concentration. But it talks about elimination of the drug from the whole body, which includes all of the different compartments and tissues. So to bring this all together, we're talking about compartments. And a lot of uh, the drugs that we discuss, we can imagine a two-compartment model. The idea that we put drug into a central compartment, which is your plasma and your vessel-rich group. And then there's a peripheral compartment, which is your muscles and your fat. And so when we give a drug, we get a quick spike in concentration. Here it is, boom, a quick spike. And then a quick decline over the course of a minute or a couple minutes. Why does it decline quickly? Is it being eliminated? No, it's actually being redistributed into the peripheral compartment. And we can look at these. Um, rate constants to understand that. The K12, the rate of going from compartment 1 to compartment 2, is 0.07 per minute, which means 7% of the drug leaves the circulation in this direction every minute. What about elimination? It's 0.004, which means 0.4% of drug leaves the circulation via elimination every minute. You can see more than 10 times uh, it, the, more, the effect of redistribution is more than 10 times greater than the effect of elimination. So we have redistribution, which is moving drug to the peripheral compartment, and then once that's in equilibrium, we have gradual elimination of drug from the body. That's plenty to discuss for this recording. Please go over these concepts. You don't have to spend a lot of time on elimination half-life and elimination clearance, just a basic quick understanding of them, but the others are important concepts and you should take the time to make sure you have them down. Please let me know if you have any questions.